I'm here with Professor Mel Greaves, Director of the new Centre for Evolution and Cancer, an exciting new initiative recently launched by the Institute of Cancer Research London. Professor Greaves, could you tell us the idea behind the new centre? Well, thank you very much, Eva. We've got a very ambitious objective for this centre, which is to apply evolutionary principles to forge what we think is a paradigm shift in how we think about cancer and understand cancer. And the way we're going to do that is applying not even only evolutionary principles, but methods from evolutionary biology and ecology to tackle some of the outstanding major questions in cancer biology. For example, why is it that all multicellular organisms develop cancer? Why is it that human beings have this extraordinary vulnerability? The statistic of one in three having cancer is remarkable. What's the reason for that? Another question is, um, how can we understand the largely covert long-term um, variable natural history of these cancers over decades or years within a patient's body. Why is it that some cancers are indolent but others become very malignant? Could we predict the evolutionary trajectory of these cancers and modify treatment? Um, and lastly, why is it that advanced cancer is so intransigent to eradication or control? Why is it that drug resistance nearly always emerges? So these are outstanding unresolved questions that we think evolutionary biology Council will help us to tackle. That sounds really interesting. Um, could you give us a bit more detail about some of the projects that will be going on in the centre? Yeah, yes, of course. We've got four teams in the centre at the present, and by the end of the year, I think there will be six. So we'll have a broad and ambitious agenda with that number of people uh, doing research. But to give you one or two uh, examples, uh, in my own leukemia team, uh, Nicola Potter and other colleagues are using single cell genetics interrogate what we call the clonal complexity of genetic architecture in cancer. And what this has already taught us is that although a patient may have a diagnosis of a leukemia or a breast cancer, in fact when we interrogate cancer at this level, what we discover is a patient has multiple cancers, albeit all linked by a clonal common ancestry in the evolutionary sense. So this changes the way you think about cancer. A patient has multiple uh, cancers that need therapeutic um, targeting. A second example is from Marco Gillinger's work, which again um, tackles clonal complexity and clonal evolution. What Marco is interested in is tracking in as sensitive a way as possible the emergence of drug resistance by looking at individual cells within the clone or by looking at markers in the plasma. If we could pick up drug resistance at a very early stage, it could have a major impact on how we manage this problem um, and, and, treat, and treat patients. The third example comes from the work of Yin Yin Yang and her group uh, within the center. Uh, she's interested in understanding the ecosystem of cancers within the tissues in which cancer develops. And the, the challenge there is to understand the selective pressures that bring about natural selection of cancer cells. If we knew more about that, I'm sure there'd be some exciting therapeutic opportunities to intervene in, um, in modifying, changing, or reducing those selective pressures. Can sound very exciting. And are there ways that this could be used in cancer treatments? Well, I think the implications for cancer treatment are, are extraordinary uh, and remar remarkable. And again, I can give you a few examples. The most general point to make is that the more we understand cancer evolutionary biology, the more we appreciate how important it is to intervene early. Once cancer evolution is up and running, there's a point of no return when cancer cells are so genetically unstable and diverse. The prospects of eliminating them all seem to me pretty remote. So it very much, evolutionary biology very much endorses the idea you have to get in as early as possible. A second possibility um, or a second concern comes from our understanding of clone complexity. I talked about clonal architecture a moment ago. Multiple subclones, each independently um, capable of killing the patient in the absence of effective treatment. And what this means for targeted therapy in personalized medicine is if you have a target that you want um, that's druggable and for which you have effective drugs. You do need to ask whether that target molecule is in every cancer cell or in a side branch of the evolutionary clone. Ideally what we should be doing is targeting mutations that are in the trunk of the tree, in the evolutionary tree, rather than the side branches. And the third point is relates to, again, drug resistance and the huge problem it poses. And really what I'm interested in is whether we could envisage a Darwinian bypass, as I like to call it. And one route to that might be through the ecosystem that I've mentioned. 
that provides us with the pressures for the emergence of, of um, vigorous cancer clones, robust cancer clones, and drug-resistant cancer clones. Um, and in fact, some of the most effective medicines we have in cancer therapy today do actually ta target the ecosystem. One example is anti-inflammatories. Aspirin is a rather effective cancer drug in gastrointestinal cancers. Anti-hormone treatments that we use for breast and prostate cancer have been very effective. Actually, uh, in, in using those therapies, we're removing positive selective pressures. So the opportunities for novel therapies targeting the ecosystem, uh, I think, are, are really rather remarkable. Thank you very much. You're welcome.